course, the, the Keats Shelley Memorial House, looked after by the Keats Shelley Memorial Association, which is a, a UK registered charity, which was founded in 1903 with the principal aim of uh, acquiring this house and saving it from demolition, which unfortunately was then, was then the plan. One of the grand plans for Piazza di Spagna was to build luxury hotels on this site. So the, the association was founded by these three venerable gentlemen. You can see photographs of them. These are the three founders of the association. And they formed the, the association in 1903. They acquired the house, or rather they raised enough money, thanks to an, an international fundraising uh, effort, they raised money to, to acquire the house in 1906. And then three years after that, on the 3rd of April 1909, hello, do you sit down? On the 3rd of April 1909, to be precise, the, the house was opened for the first time as a, as a museum and library um, in a grand ceremony attended by the King of Italy and Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> so it's a bit of a gold standard for subsequent foundations of house museums. And um, we've continued ever since then, apart from a brief spell during the Second World War, when the museum was closed and the plaques were taken down and the collection was removed, was taken to uh, Monte Cassino, the Abbey there, to protect it, which was then considered the safest place in Italy, but of course turned out to be quite the contrary. And um, it, was, it was stored there for safekeeping during the Second World War. Being a British museum uh, in German occupied it at that time was, was deemed rather dangerous. But apart from that, we've been, we've been functional and, and open since then. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, the support, um, I think Perry will also thank them, but the support of the Murrays, John and Virginia Murray, and their charitable foundation. For those of you who don't know John Murray, they were the publishers of, uh, well, the list goes on forever, but uh, amongst the many notable names are Lord Byron, Jane Austen, Charles Darwin, it goes on. Um, sadly, not Keats, or, or Shelley for that matter, but Byron is certainly a, a link for us as well because the Keats Shelley Memorial Association is dedicated to, not only to Keats and to Shelley, but to other poets of the second generation uh, of the English Romantics who lived in and who were inspired by Rome. So we're very glad that these, these, um, these traditions carry on to this day. And the Murrays are very supportive of, of everything that we do, and they have uh, helped finance this latest venture, Kelly Cox's um, sojourn in Rome. She spent um, one month working at the BSR, and one month working for us, although she's still in residence at the BSR, I believe. Um, so, so that's our story, in a nutshell. Of course, our story goes way back beyond 1903, right back to, to Keats's stay in Rome. He arrived here, we're almost coming up to the anniversary, he arrived here on the 15th of November, 1820, in the company of the artist Joseph Seven, who looked after Keats. Keats, of course, like many poets and writers, uh, uh, artists of his generation, dreamed about coming to Italy. Uh, you could read one of his early sonnets, Happy is England, where, you know, which was written in the aftermath of uh, the Battle of Waterloo, where he dreamed about travelling to Italy and city, sitting upon an Alp as on a throne. Um, but he didn't get here until, 19, uh, until 1820, November of that month. And uh, like his contemporaries, he wanted to come to Italy, but unlike them, he came predominantly for his health. Um, I suppose you could argue in today's language, he would have been a health tourist, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. But he came here because he was suffering desperately uh, from tuberculosis, a disease which had also had previously killed his, his mother and his younger brother. And so he was to live in this very house uh, for just three and a half months. He died on the 23rd of February, 1821. And this particular museum was, as I say, was found, founded 80 years after that to honour Keats, but also to honour the other Romantic poets who had been inspired by Italy. Shelley, of course, as you all probably all know the story of Shelley, you can see some, some pictures there that narrate the story of his death, his, the discovery of his body on the beach at Viareggio and his cremation. And we also have some if you're feeling gruesome, you can look at some of the relics that we have a piece of Shelley's jawbone, for example, which was saved from the, the funeral pyre. But we won't go into that now. We've also got a, a substantial collection of artefacts uh, relating to, to Lord Byron, to Mary Shelley, as well as to others connected with that circle. So the museum really is a testament not only to Keats and to his fellow romantics, but also to, I suppose, to the love affair between 
England and Italy, and the literary friendship between these two these two countries, which I think continues to this day, and some of the Pelle Cox is a testament to that ongoing friendship. An English poet and an Italophile. And we'll see what she has to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome Pelle. Thanks, Giuseppe. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. It's nice to see you in a different environment. And this environment, that's a very beautiful sight to see all my new friends in the place I love probably most in the world. Um, I'd like to thank um, Giuseppe, first of all, because uh, I think it was five years ago I kind of knocked on his door when I was at the RA and said, uh, I found some, some great artists love the Romantics, so is that enough of an excuse for me to be able to come and do a performance here? Everyone's always looking for an excuse to come to Rome, aren't they? And some beautiful things come out of it sometimes. And our collaboration was one of them. And Giuseppe is the kind of curator that every artist and poet loves because he's brave enough to just let you do what you said you were going to do without making you explain too much. Um, and so I'm used to standing here with um, three handsome actors at each hand and being able to just sit back and not do much. And today I don't have them with me, um, so forgive me. For any blundering. Um, I played Mary Shelley when we did the event called Unbound and one of and Shelley stood here, Christian Rowe, and Byron stood here, Edward Ackroot, and I was Mary and I forgot my lines a million times and they managed to pick me up and they're just so skilled and talented the way that actors even when reciting poetry, can sustain the narrative when you've forgotten everything and you're just blowing the whole deal. So I'd like to thank my actors who aren't here, who I love and adore. Um, most of all, I'd like to thank uh, John and Ginny Murray, who Giuseppe mentioned, John and Virginia Murray, who run probably the most important publishing house that's ever been, or one of anyway. But they're the only ones I've met, and they're the only ones who don't let the fact they're historic get in the way of how deeply contemporary they are. But the historic publishers are historic because they were deeply contemporary at the time. That's how they've lasted so long. And they don't let that get encrusted in anything. And I'm happy to be, I'm privileged to be a representation of the fact that they are eternally young and brave in spirit. And they're an example to all of us. So I just wish they were here right now. Okay, I'm just going to talk... Um, as much as I can, I'm, I'm going to eat the elephant in very small pieces and we will have only dealt with the leg. But it will be hopefully quite a poetic leg. Um, I always feel like um, talking about the romantics is like pitching a tent. Um, you have to get the hooks in the ground first um, before you can let the canopy of it envelop your audience. And today I have four hooks that I'd like to use to help envelop you in this wonderful world that they've given all that know them well. Um, the first is this house. So, you know, imagine that you are sitting in a place where Keats walked in almost 200 years ago to die, knowing that he was going to die. And that in the silences he exists. So um, in the spaces between the poems I'm going to read to you, and when I take a breath, or when I stop talking for a few moments, just notice that he's here too. Um, also, the other tent peg is Giuseppe, who, without, who I will never have been here, standing here now, and who's also a good friend. And the fourth tent peg is um, the script, the third tent peg is the script. So um, I'm using extracts from um, Lift Me Up, I Am Dying, which was the second event I came to do here, which is the event that was purely about Keats's dying days and featured two actors, Severin, who was the artist who came with him, and Keats. Um, and then the fourth tent peg is your own impressions. So, you know, I'm just the facilitator. Um, I hope that it will inspire you to maybe buy this amazing new anthology that Keith Shelley has published for only £10. It's the best edit <laughs> of the romantics I've ever read. Um, and that you'll just come away with a new understanding of um, a few of the themes that the romantics have ingrained in us for all eternity. Some of which we don't even realise they ingrained in us. 
Um, so, to start, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, maybe less actually. Um, I want to start um, on the matter of Mary Shelley, Shelley and Byron, um, who were all congregated together in this extraordinary vision of their own exile, bravery, poeticism, majesty, sense of adventure, and all rocked up at the Villa Diodati um, in Geneva in 1816 in terrible bloody weather. In fact, the weather was so awful that they all had to stay inside for about uh, two weeks or something. Um, and the reason, part of the reason the weather was so awful was because an, a volcano had erupted in Japan and the whole of Europe was in an ash cloud. Peter probably knows about this. Um, the whole of Europe was in an ash cloud. So it wasn't just stormy, it was also toxic and almost impenetrable. And something about this weather must have sent them inside and inspired them to start exploring each other's psyches. Um, also, it, in terms of the climate, the scientific climate, genetics was becoming a real, a real a word on everyone's lips. They, they were into how things might move without God. They were looking at uh, lightning. Um, flashing through trees and seeing as, as if the tree almost moved from the lightning. So that was all in its genus. So on this one particular night, the most famous night of their stay at Villa Diodati, um, they decide they're going to tell each other ghost stories. They light candles, they, they don't turn all the lights off because they didn't have any. But if they had, they would have turned them off. Um, and they start, they decide they're going to start freaking each other out. Um, Byron and Shelley have only just met, and theirs is one of the most it's historic friendships in literature. Um, so they're all excited about the fact they found each other. Mary and Shelley have just met, and they've fallen madly in love. And so I'm sure Shelley's in, in a hiatus about this new woman he has with him. And there's also Claire Claremont, who's encouraged the Shelleys to come, Mary and Shelley to come, because she fancies Byron. And she's hoping to get together with him. So without Claire Claremont, who's Mary's half-sister, none of this would have happened. I'm partly talking about this in detail because I asked Stephen, our lovely director, if he felt that the BSR was in any way related to the romantic imagination or sensibility. And he said yes, because he felt that giving people space and time to interact and think um, elicited the unknown parts of us that, you know, I don't know, there's no, there's no last word for that yet, I suppose. Um, anyway, so they told each other ghost stories. Um, uh, Byron read uh, a verse from a Byron, a, a Coleridge poem called Christabel, and um, Shelley ran screaming from the room because he was so freaked out by it. I mean, can you imagine being so freaked out by a poem that you run screaming from the room? Um, my friend Mary, um, Susie Fay says that it was like a kind of snuff movie or something, they were all out to just blow each other's minds. And Mary, sitting there quietly, as she often did, um, went upstairs to bed and wrote Frankenstein, started to write Frankenstein, one of the greatest novels ever written. She was only 16 at the time. Um, I'd also like to say, in the spirit of collaboration, that Shelley did help her a lot with Frankenstein, he helped to edit it, he helped to construct it. Um, also, Byron was a great admirer of Mary. And without this spirit in this house, it never would have been written. So, I mean, I'm a great um, advocator of collaboration, and I, I think that's one of the greatest examples of it. And the poets, that's how the poets did it. Um, so, these guys never really met Keats. Shelley admired Keats from afar. But Byron didn't really approve of Keats's low upbringing, so um, he wasn't allowed into the, the clique. Um, they were a bit dismissive of Keats. A lot of people were dismissive of Keats because he was one of the Cockney poets. He wasn't an aristocrat. Um, he didn't write with his high-minded ideals. Um, but um, the one person who did notice what a deeply significant voice he was, after all, was Shelley. 
and when um, Shelley went sailing on his boat, um, what was the coast he sailed off? The Ligurian and Tuscany. Liguria. Yeah. Thanks. Um, when his body was washed up on the coast of the Regio, two weeks yeah. later, um, what they found in his breast pocket was a copy of Keats's poetry. So Shelley was reading Keats, and Shelley knew how deeply important this voice, this man, this spirit was. Um, bear with me a sec. So, um, the other thing that's significant about Shelley is that um, when Keats died, Shelley wrote a poem for him. And it's one of Shelley's greatest poems. It's called Adonais. It's incredibly long. 16 stanzas, maybe more, 20. Um, and it's about the death of this great spirit. Now, lots of poets were dying at that time. Um, why did she Shelley choose to write this great epic about Keats, about this young man he'd hardly met? I'm going to try and help you unpack that. Um, so, one of the reasons I think that Shelley, in a transmutable form, felt that Keats was so important was because of something Keats coined, which was... a um, concept called negative capability. Does anybody know about negative capability? Uh, it's so funny because it defines all of us in the way we, well, especially the artists and poets, in the way we think and approach a, a blank space. Um, what it means is that it's okay to be unresolved. It's okay to not quite know what you're writing about, painting about, thinking about. It's okay to feel really dark and messed up for that stuff, and for that to be the lead, take the lead in terms of expression. Um, it seems quite natural now, but at the time, when you look at it being set up against um, some of the great constructed epics, it was a very profound thing to say about being able to make a mark. Um, Keats, it's Keats, Keats coined it, Keats did it, Keats said it, and this is what he said. One of the things he said. Negative capability, that is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, <coughs> mysteries, bless you, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated vermissitude caught from the penetralanium of mystery, from being incapable of remaining content with half-knowledge. This pursued through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this, that with a great poet the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration, or rather obliterates all consideration. So Keats was into obliterating all consideration, all the considered pre prerequisites, formal natures. He just needed poetry for another reason. The reason he needed poetry um, was for a number of reasons. And the reason he created this concept of negative capability was because for him poetry was a place to recover, um, find elation, um, get over the grief that he'd suffered from the death of most of the members of his family. Um, his father was knocked off his horse when he was very young. His mother didn't die long after. His two brothers both died of tuberculosis and then eventually he died himself. So people, you know, we have a tendency to read Keats and think, oh, he was so elevated. His like the language is so decorative. Um, there's a kind of privileged opulence, perhaps, you might say, in the way you might receive a line. But if you understand that the reason that he's writing like that is because he's trying to escape, he's trying to be free, he's trying to have a relationship that's beyond the, the dowdy nature of some of the experience life brings to us, then it's a completely different thing. And if you think about negative capability, and that he's saying it's okay to just not be sure when, you, when your mark hits the page, 
you could say he was like one of the great abstract painters. You could say he was like Rothko of his time. Um, so I'm just going to read you one because he's definitely better at saying any of it than I am. And I want to read um, to Autumn. Um, this is one of his great odes that was written under in, when he was in Hampstead. Uh, he wrote six great odes in two months, April and May of 1819. So some of the greatest poems ever written in English language were written within two months. Six odes by one man. That's Ode to a Nightingale, Ode to Autumn, um, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to Melancholy. I mean, read them all. Take a lifetime. Learn them all off by heart. It will change the way you see the world forever. But all I can give you is this now. And I've chosen this one from the six because it reminds me of... It's called To Autumn and it reminds me of us all in Rome, even though it's not about Rome. It seems so like it. The other reason I've picked it is because on the back of this book, um, the poem is mentioned by Seamus Heaney. And Seamus Heaney says about Ode to Autumn, Even as a schoolboy, I loved John Keats's Ode to Autumn. For being an arc of the covenant between language and sensation. So this poem has no raison d'etre apart from itself. It's all about Keats's relationship to his the impressions he was having when looking at this season and its impact on the spirit of the world. It's language and sensation in its pure form. It's, it's an in intoxication. To Autumn. Seasons of mist and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun, Conspire with, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the ground and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granite floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies while they hook, spurs the next wave and all its twin flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with a patient look thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Hey, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too, while barred clouds bloom with the soft dying day, and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a willful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft, or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourne, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. It's a very simple thing. And it is abstract if you think about it conceptually. And I spend my life trying to strip back the opulence and find his voice. The voice underneath the words, actually. Okay, so that's a bit of negative capability for you. Despite all this, all this burgeoning genius, um, Keats didn't get a very good reception in England. Um, he published two collections. Um, 
Lockhart, his great critic, said it's, he was a surgeon before he was a poet, Keats. It's a better and wiser thing to be a starved apothecary than a starved poet. So back to the shop, Mr John. Back to the plasters, pills and ointment boxes. Um, the dismissal was as political as literary and it was aimed at upstart young writers who weren't posh enough and were deemed as uncouth for their lack of education, non-formal rhyming and low diction. They'd not attended Eton, Harrow or Oxbridge, basically. And they were not the upper classes, so they would try and silence and gag the voices of these great minds. Um, Keats thought he would never make it, he would never be read, he would never be heard. Um, he was going to die young. And um, th these people are partly the reason he felt that way. Um, Keats started to get ill and um, it dawned on him that he might have to leave England. Um, not only was this a tragedy in terms of his career and his health, but also because he'd fallen in love, madly in love, with um, a, a girl called Fanny Braun. Fanny Braun's family had also been quite ill from tuberculosis, so I imagine there was a lot of empathy between them. She lived very nearby. Um, I mean, that, none of that explains the extraordinary nature of Keats's love for her. Um, when he got ill, <coughs> he would lend her books and literature, share all that stuff. I mean, this is also the beginning of how these romantic relationships started. Keats helped to carve this thing, these things out. And he would pass copies of Dante's Inferno out through the window because he was frightened that she might catch his... TV and so there was this whole idea of distance and proximity which did fuel his work and um, we read the Eve of St Agnes last night in group and um, Keats loved Fanny so much that he was actually trying to write himself into poems in order to feel close to her. Um, Eve of St Agnes is all about um, this special celebration where virgins are meant to dream of their future husbands at night. And um, Keats actually makes the young hero in the poem um, infiltrate, inveigle, involve himself in the heroine while she's asleep. Um, some people are saying that this is actually, and now saying that the, that the heroine in the poem is raped by Keats, raped by the hero, raped by the poet. I mean, read it, see if you think that's true. Um, so Keats starts to realise he's coming to Rome. He writes, he's going to have to go to Rome. Suppose me to Rome. Well, I should there see you as in a magic glass going to and from town at all hours. I wish you could infuse a little confidence in human nature into my heart. I cannot muster any. The world is too brutal for me. I am glad there is such a thing as the grave. I am sure I shall never have any rest until I get there. At any rate, I will indulge myself by never being, never seeing any more Dilk or Brown or any of their friends. I wish I was either in your arms, full of faith, or that a thunderbolt would strike me. Still he heads for Rome with his friend Severin. Actually, his friend, that's not actually accurate, for Severin hardly knew him before he decided to come to Rome. Um, Keats was looking for a companion, and um, Severin was up for it because he was an artist, and he thought he might make some good exhibitions out here, and get some good paintings of ruins done. Little did he know that he was going to have a relationship with one of the most profound souls of, of, of human, of, civilization of history and he forgot all about his art um, and just um, focused on making sure that poor Keats didn't die in too much pain. In fact he did actually paint this, this is by Joseph Southern and it's of Shelley sitting in the bars of Caracalla writing Prometheus Unbound, have a look at it later, a very famous image of the romantic imagination. And um, he also sketched Keats on his deathbed. And the sketch is there in the room in which Keats died, which I can't show you all, but it's too small. Um, but their relationship was profound. 
and um, in my event 